well, here we are this evening. This is the, well, I've decided to call this for myself the Not So Hidden Pages, but I don't know how Sammy feels about this title. Not So Hidden Pages is good. What do they, what do they call the Walking Dead one? Is it? Uh, it's like the Talking Dead. The Talking Dead. That's pretty clever. So this is the Hidden Pages after show slash pre-show, because we're going to talk about an episode of the past and an episode of the future, mm. which is, I feel, very Hidden Pages, because... Our show knows no time boundaries. At least that's the the goal. Yeah. Um, did you introduce yourself? I did not. I'm Aaron Gould. I'm uh, one of the one of I'm fifty percent of the writing and the creation of Hidden Pages, and the guy across from me is. I'm Sammy Sarzosa. I am all the other fifty percent. Uh, I'm the glass half empty. I guess. I like <laughs> to think the glass half full. I like to think of us as the we're a two plus two equals five unit. Mm. You know, we we add up the the sum of the parts is greater, or the sum of the parts is greater than the parts individually. I know that's a not a very nice. That's not the cleanest way to say that, but it's something like that. Okay, I'm not good at math, so I'll take your word for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so I thought we'd uh, we talk about our most our first episode, the pilot, Eternal Chorus, and we could just begin with, I guess. You know how the show came about in the first place, and then we'll lead into write the writing of that episode and uh, what we think about it now that it's out in the world, living its life, life of luxury. Yeah, I have an empty nest now in my computer because it is out in the world. I've let go. And it's... <clears throat> One more child has since <laughs> left the left the nest. Yeah. It is. It is. We should talk about that. It, that there is a trickiness to finally. You, when getting to the point and saying this is done it's going out there and I'm going to I think like Milton Friedman he's an economist like he said about one of his books people were uh, somebody was saying like oh don't you feel the need to defend your book when people criticize it about this or that and he's like you know a book is kind of like a child you, you do the best you can to raise it and then you you put it out in the world and that's and that's it you know that's the best you can do and so I thought that was that's kind of how I've thought of a lot of the things I put in the public after it's incubated as well. I don't know. Do you feel the same? Uh, yeah, yeah. I tend to write about fear a lot in a lot of my work that I do outside of hidden pages. I mean, hidden pages has a lot of, has to do a lot about fear, but it's one of my themes is like dealing with fear. Mm. And um, like, what, like what kind of fear? Like any kind of fear, like fear of. From fear, fear of, of like, like getting out of bed in the morning to fear of getting abducted by aliens. Fear of like sock monkeys. Like, yeah, like whatever yeah. your fear is, like uh, creepy clowns or just like paying your bills. Like, <laughs> wow, you know, it's like a lot of my characters, a lot of my stories have to do with fear. I guess so. I know um, a lot of my dreams have to do with fear. It seems like I think I read a book about dreams, and it was like the the number one emotion in in dreams is anxiety, uh-huh. and it's followed closely by pleasure. And then fear, and like everything else is like way down the percentage <laughs> line. So, so I, I think you're tapping into the subconscious. I guess so. Very guess much so. So. Um, so I think it's like for me, it's just being like putting something out there is just me conquering a bit of my own fear. I mm-hmm. guess so. That's what I look at it as. You got to be like a little bit fearless and just be like, it's done. This is the best I can do at this point in time. I could spend forever on it, but it just has to. I just get out. sick of things after a while. I'm like, you know what? I'm I'm done thinking about this, and I'm just I'm ready to push it off the cliff. Yeah, I, I mean, I get a little bit of that too, as well. Like sometimes you just like, how many times could you live with it? Yeah. And like how how long can you live with it? How Although long? I have to admit, and this dovetails perfectly, I had a good time writing Eternal Chorus, and I really wanted to do more with it, but I felt like we had done quite a bit. You know, we went from zero to one with that, and. I thought Eternal Chorus was one of the first things that I was really, I really wanted to spend more time on and could like just sit with it forever because I loved the characters, I loved the where it was going and like the universe. So, so yeah, I think, uh, so I, I, how did we start all this again? I don't even remember ex- exactly the details of, I think you and I were just sitting drinking too much coffee one morning and we were like, why aren't we writing stuff or something like that? That's how I remember it. Yeah, I think we were meeting up for coffee couple times a month I think at that point and we were just uh, yeah I think I mean I write, write scripts I'm a screenwriter and you know trying to break into TV as well um, but you spend so much time writing the stuff that you know that you're either not going to show anybody because it's not fully developed or that stuff that just like only a handful of people like read or um, 
get to experience. And I think, uh, I think it, the genesis was that I was kind of, I think we were having that conversation where you've written stuff too that, you know, you know, who's going to read it yeah. in this format because screenplay format isn't really something that's, um, that the public seeks out to like read. It's just, you know, a handful of, you know, agents, managers, executives, maybe it's some It's an peers. ugly format to read, yeah. It's yeah, not- it's kind of like a, it's not a friendly, you know, it's not like novel reading or an article or something like that. Um, because there's so much white space and there's like the narrative, you know. There's, there's a lot like, of esoteric, yeah, like uh, uh, abbreviations and things yeah. that only only people who understand screenwriting know or yeah. filmmaking. It's almost like a, another language, you know. Or it's, a, it's, a it's, well, it's, it's truly, it's like, it's not unlike programming language in that it's programmatic. I mean, you're, you're using abstraction to represent larger concepts and so thus you're, you lose a lot of the, the detail unless you're trained in it. Yeah, so I think that you had the experiment that you wanted to um, try to have someone read one of my scripts so, so, so somebody could listen to it instead of reading it. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, we live in Los Angeles. A lot of people sit in traffic. Um, <clears throat> I think that your idea was, well, what if we record some of this and maybe somebody could listen to it? You listen to your screenplay in traffic instead of having to read it. Like, was that a more of a friendly way to experience a screenplay than to have to sit behind a desk and, like, you know, read it? Yeah, and I was like, sure. Like, I got lots of stuff you can read, <laughs> have somebody read. So I think uh, it was my uh, headshot pilot uh, called uh, the Treehouse, and which yeah, is available I, on my website. I, I think it's I, made a YouTube on it. Yeah, and, I recorded that, and it's on my website. So if anybody wants to listen to it, I think Kate, Derek, Kate, yeah, Kate voice? Huffman, who is Chelsea and who is Chelsea and the infamous Comus in Eternal Chorus. Oh, yeah, she was Comus as well. And she's, she's in the new episode as well. Yeah, Kate Kate recorded Treehouse. Uh, I, I, like Sammy said, I wanted to get more of my friends' great writing into the public eye, and so I decided to make uh, a lot of them into audiobooks, basically, and put them out into the world via getsoundscripts.com, but that's a conversation for another time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that was the genesis of it because I listened to it and I was like, "This is pretty cool." Like mm. what you know, she was doing the voices for the different characters and stuff, and uh, um, kind of reading the description in a funny way, with a bit of emphasis and stuff. Um, I think too, we weren't, we felt like we weren't tackling topics that we wanted to tackle regularly. Like you wanted to kind of deal with more of the, and I know we've sort of shifted gears a little bit as we write, but you wanted to talk about you know, certain fun conspiracy ideas or like the catacombs of France. I remember there, that was one idea you were, you found really fascinating. And then like the Bigfoot kind of things. And it's just, nobody really, these scripts, these, these things can never get pitched. It seems like as like a a TV show or a feature film. And, but, but you and I loved these ideas. And so I think that was one of the things too, is like, we, we wanted to show that could really be a be a vehicle for all these ideas that we never had a chance to work with yeah definitely um i think i mean just listening to that little bit that you had kate do in my script i was like well i think it's what we started talking about what if we did like a more actors and like a like a yeah like an episodic like an episodic thing thing. maybe like i like the twilight zone outer limits um i liked goosebumps yeah like i mean i like the goosebumps are you afraid of the dark yeah um tales from the crypt you know, I remember a friend and I, mm-hmm. I was telling my, one of my coworkers, like, I remember, like, my best friend in fifth grade, we would, like, sit in the basement, we went to this really Christian school, but somehow he talked his mom into buying, like, a Mortal Kombat, like, the Genesis edition, <laughs> with, was, like, the blood was, and stuff. <laughs> that was a very, a very amazing sell that he did, he's a very talented young yeah, man. Yeah, like, she didn't know, like, what it was, and so she just bought it, and we were just, like, sitting in the basement and play that, and then, like, when she went to sleep, and sleep over, you know, like, we would, right. we would go Mom, upstairs. It's a, and, it's a Christian game, it's about <laughs> Jesus, Kombat. you know, in the, when he fights off the Pharisees. And, uh, we would go upstairs, you know, after she retired for the evening, and we would watch Tales from the Crypt. Like the old, yeah. I guess they would edit the HBO one. And mm-hmm. It was on like a local station, like at you know eleven o'clock at night, and so we would stay up and like watch Tales from the Crypt. I think you know Tales from the Crypt. I started up as a comic book series a long time yeah, ago, I think right? Back in like you know, it's fifties or sixties. It's funny how that keeps popping up in popular culture. I mean, because Stephen King, I know, was hugely influenced by Tales of the Crypt. I mean, so many of his stories came from those those comics, and I know a ton of other people. So it's it's really it's interesting how certain 
um, I guess franchises you could say or ideas keep popping up in the popular culture as influence but I, I didn't know about Tales of the Crypt actually I think this is the first time you've mention that to me yeah so like i think that was like kind of an influence like i love those shows like mm. i love like an anthology kind of a thing um even to a certain extent like today the black mirror show like what was the one that was john carpenter like a, like all these famous directors like masters of horror i really liked those mm. uh, i know that wasn't quite the same but it was sort of like epi- it was a uh, not episodic but i mean it was a it was a show that had like a theme and each time there was like a theme attached to it and there was a uh, something extravagant in each epi- like each each episode felt like an event like that's what i kind of liked about even the goosebumps tv show is i mean it's one i i like shows too that have like a narrative and you follow this long story and it feels almost like a novel i like that stuff too but there's also something special about a show uh where each time it's like a new story i mean it's it's kind of like cuz cuz something's Trying to hard to it's kind of hard to explain, but I think shows can jump the shark pretty easily, pretty quickly with the same set of characters and the same thing. Because usually the first season has like some big obstacle the character's trying to mm-hmm. to accomplish, and if the character doesn't accomplish it, that's a little fatiguing. And if he or she does accomplish it, then you're like, well, what else is there to watch? So it's kind of cool to have like a a show where each each time you see it, it's a it's a new story, it's a new thing. But at the same time you know that you're going to get a certain quality or a certain mood, whatever the case may be. Yeah, there's. I think it was a really um, key show that probably influenced me growing up because I used to love the Muppets. I still do love the Muppets, but like the Jim Henson puppets and stuff was yeah. uh, the storyteller. Hmm. And it was like this guy, and he's in a chair, and he had like a little Muppet dog, and then he would say, like, we're going to tell a story from mythology or history. Like a fable. It's called, the, it's called the, what was it? The, the Storyteller? Story yeah. I think it was released on DVD like I never heard of it. I'll 10 years it ago. Up. And the same thing. Like it would just be like a Greek mythology tale or a fable. 90s show or what was it? Um, probably older? like late 80s, early oh, 90s. Oh, older. Okay. Yeah, eight, late 80s and early 90s when the Muppets were like. <clears throat> I think it would show that and then like at the end would be like a five minute Fraggle Rock episode. That's huh. how Fraggle Rock started. Right. Um, but, uh, but so I think those were the influences kind of that influenced me. Fraggle Rock was also R.L. Stein, wasn't it? As well, like like Batley and all that, or was that Ursula's been. Castle? I'm thinking of. Never it mind. Have been that That's one. Ursula's Castle. Yeah. So I think uh, so. We think we started there when we started talking about like those shows, and I mean, I really enjoy uh, just kind of a one-off episode too. Like, yeah, you know, not not a particular. You can just watch one. Like I, even in comic, like I read comic books too, but not not religiously, and I don't subscribe to anything or like get regular issues every month. But like a lot of my favorite ones are just like oh. Batman is going to be in Sherlock Holmes times or Batman's yeah. going to be uh-huh. in like medieval times or it's Batman, yeah. but he's a uh, Ronin like in Japan or something like that. Huh. I like those one off like, yeah. one shots, you know, comic book have one shots. Like those are my favorite ones to read or like a Marvel team up or like a, mm-hmm. or, like a what if, you know, issue of comic books. Cause it's like, I just want to read one story. Like all I have the time is for one story or this is like, I want to be like satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to have to like wait till the next issue or whatever. So, so we agreed um, that we both liked, epi- or we 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 liked these mm-hmm. um, these one shot formats. And then I think we just I think we just kind of one day we're just like let's just do it. Like what's what's stopping us? Let's just produce it. Yeah, yeah. And so we intended on the first episode being like, look, let's just make make them really short, easy. It'll be like fifteen minutes. And then the first thing <laughs> we come up with is like a fifty page like pi- basically a TV show pilot. I mean, it was that yeah, really. quality. I mean, it was written in kind of your standard three act structure. I mean, it had like all the beats of a TV show and uh and it was really it was really fun. I mean, it was uh I think this was the first time I have written that show was the first time I'd written anything that closely with somebody. I mean, I'd kind of written some things with friends off and on like short films and stuff, but this was the first project I'd ever like genuinely integrated my writing with somebody else's and it was I mean I've I see why why people do it now because it's it's so it it was such a great experience to just kind of like to be stuck on something and then kind of like send it off and have an answer come back like that it was and vice versa like it was kind of cool to because like it's hard for me to answer my own questions like when I'm writing something when I was writing something for the first episode I was like I don't know what to say here I don't know what to do Mm -hmm. so I would just leave it blank send it to you and come back and there'd be there'd be a solution and i thought that was that was the it was like an automated uh writing app 
it was it was pretty sweet. Yeah, I like that too. Like I was telling <laughs> my friends, like they're like, how's it with how's it what it's like working with a partner now or for this project? And I was like, oh, it's cool. Like, I'll do my draft, turn it in, and then like. You know, get it back while I was watching TV and be like, oh, I give myself a pat on the back. Like, yeah, it's done now. <laughs> oh, well, good job. I did a rewrite while I was watching TV. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I lo- that's what I like about it is, uh, is things just get done faster and they get done better. Like I've learned so much working with you on this project. I mean, like I'll write something. And I'll be like, that's kind of boring, but I'll send it to Sammy anyways. And then you, you come back and you have these like ideas and these additions to it. And I'm like, it's like, it's like, wow, that is exactly what that scene needed or that's exactly what that character needed to say. Mm-hmm. And it's just so, I learn so much faster doing that. I mean, it's so, it's so I've written plenty of things on my own, but it, it's always so painstaking. And so it's really, it's really fun to see the, how, I mean, like we're on like what, basically we're on the third script now, which is you've, you've done like 70% of the work already. And then like we're, we're in a synopsis stage on the fourth one. I mean, I've never written that much content that fast of that quality either. So, yeah, yeah, same here. Like I like same thing. Like I just turned in the draft of the third episode to you, and it was just like, you know, I felt like uh, yeah, it's okay. So, yeah. but now I'm excited to see what you're gonna write. And re- I mean, even things that you told me that you're gonna write, I'm getting really excited about. Like, oh, I would have never thought of that. Or yeah, oh, that's a good angle on this or that. You know, to get a really good, satisfying ending. I must well, say, so. yeah, it's like I think I think what works for me best about this, I mean, and I learned this because we both did the second episode and then the third episode, which will never be the. There's the third episode that was written that that will probably never be released, and then there's the third episode that we're actually producing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I learned because we got really excited after Eternal Chorus and we really liked it, and then we thought, oh, we would just go off and write our own things and then bring it back to each other, and then when we kind of went off and did like ninety percent of the work on each other's end and came back hoping the other person could just add 10% and like wrap it up. It just didn't feel like we produced what we wanted to produce doing mm-hmm. that. So I felt like that kind of really slow iteration, not not slow, but that stair step uh, process that we did with Eternal Chorus because the first thing we did was, was we got together and we came up with like a list of ideas and then we agreed on uh, like the Oregon Vortex concept seemed kind of cool because that's what Eternal Chorus is based on. And then I said, great, I'll come up with like a really loose synopsis and see what you think. And then I sent you the synopsis and you're like, yeah, it's good, but it really needs more of this. And then we just kept like, we neither one of us did a whole bunch of work and then came back to the other. It was like, we both slowly worked our way up until we agreed that we could go to the next level. And I, I know that seems kind of tedious for some people, but for me, it felt really it felt really like we got the best quality. Sorry, I'm totally like drinking a beer right now and like <laughs> belching all over the place. I forgive you. It's pretty awesome, right? Really. I forgive you. I don't know about them. I don't know about them, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they'll appreciate this situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, I mean, going back to how we developed it, I guess, I think we had just a lot of like <clears throat> ideas and we were, it took us long. I think it took us long, about eight months probably to develop what this wanted, what we wanted to be it sound like. The it characters. took us way too long, yeah. Uh, but I think for the best as well, because. Um, well, because we didn't, we didn't. I didn't. I know. I don't know about you, but I didn't really start getting excited about this until like we had kind of almost wrapped up the. I don't know. Like I don't know if it was around the time we wrapped up the script, around the time we actually recorded it, and I started listening to the recording, and I was like, "This is really fun." Yeah, I think that. that that's probably yeah. the time that I felt really yeah. excited. Was I heard when you sent me like the rough draft of the first episode, and I was like, "This is." I was like laughing. This is. It was like yeah. this is great. Like it's the like hearing. Uh, who does the narrator? I'm sorry. I, I've never oh, Eric it. Pierce. Eric yeah. Pierce. It's sad. Sammy was supposed to meet all the, like, we are supposed <laughs> to have such a grand, uh, uh, ep- like a grand round table tonight. Never met any and, of them. And now it's just me and Sammy. <laughs> so, but someday we'll have them all on the show. Well, all the it's actors. a good one. For the first one, it's good to just me and you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Eric Pierce is an awesome narrator. Everybody, everybody seemed to like him. Yeah. So it was like, I was just like, this is fantastic. Because um, as a writer too, like it's, it's really hard to... You work like in a, in a in a vacuum a lot of times, and you don't know how your words sound a lot of times with actors. And you can set up a round table or a meeting with some people to do the voices or say the words out loud. But uh, you know, this is just good practice for me as well to just hear people. You know, really good people. The cast is fantastic, I think, and just like hearing the words and uh, I couldn't be happier with the interacting with each other and stuff too. Yeah. Um, I could not be happier with the friends that I have who are talented actors and performers who, who do the parts. I mean, it's really, I had somebody too. I worked on a editing job recently cause I'm a, I'm a full-time producer and editor for video content. 
and I worked on something recently and the, the director of the project shot in San Francisco and uh, she was complaining about like the quality of her actors and I was like really San Francisco it seems like you could have your kind of pick of the litter it's a you know arts town and there's a lot of people who are very uh, you know, theatrically inclined there you could say and she was like you know like you don't realize how talented everybody is in Los Angeles until you leave it and that I've always I really kind of took that to heart as I was working on hidden pages because I was like man that's that might be kind of true because I don't imagine I mean it was it just seemed like the perfect storm of this it's like having a great band you got a great lead singer you got a great drummer and a great guitarist I mean how often does that happen it definitely doesn't happen too often in a place like you know Mesa Arizona for example where I'm from but it's like you you go to say Tennessee or you go to um Nashville you're probably going to get some a really banging band together pretty quickly and I, that's kind of that's kind of how I felt with Hidden Pages is I felt like we just got a really good band together. Yeah, definitely. Um yeah, so I think that's when I got excited about it for the first yeah. time. But we did go through a lot of a lot of iterations of this cuz I mean we were we were building this from the ground up cuz there was nothing I mean we had I'm, no format, we had nothing. Yeah, yeah, like we didn't there was I don't even think there's anything. I mean we've been discussing like we, I don't really think there's anything that's quite like this yeah. that's in a podcast or audio narrative form um so like it was a lot of building from scratch so we went through like different i think at one point you talked about all these episodes being like people talking in a chat room or something like that and then going i think into i think story. that was actually your idea that i i, I stomped on <laughs> i, <laughs> I apologize for that yeah so, but I mean, but we didn't know. We were like, was this good? Maybe it was, was idea. It's like, like, can we keep this yeah. up for eight episodes too? Like, you know, there was just a lot of that mm. kind of thing um, to have to consider. That's know? kind of the beauty of it too, is like, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't, I don't even know who I, whose idea the chat room thing was. And that's, I, I and, tell you. and that's kind of what's cool about writing together is you, you lose your sense of self and, and that's what makes it special is because you, obviously for my feature or anything else that I've written, I know who wrote, I mean, I know every part because I wrote everything, mm -hmm. but what's cool about hidden pages is it's, is when you work with somebody like this, you don't, it, it, it's like you participating in a show that you like rather than a show that you've written. And sometimes I feel like my third person perspective on a show that I'm watching or listening to is so much better at objective criticism and coming up with ideas than it is something I'm working on. Mm -hmm. But like with hidden pages, since it, it almost feels like something that I haven't really worked on because you've done so much stuff. I don't even remember what was yours, what was mine. And it feels like I'm working on it. It'd be as if like somebody said, Aaron, like, you know, Breaking Bad, like, here's this episode, like, like, what would you have done with it or something like that? It's just so much easier for me to be kind of like a critic on something that I've had no, no attachment to. Mm -hmm. And that's what's great about working like with a partner is you get to a point where you forget what you've written. So it feels like you're watching somebody else's stuff and it's just so much easier to talk about it and, and think about it for me at least. Yeah, no, I mean, I've listened to it like eight or nine times probably. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, yeah, cause it's something, I always catch something new cause on it, like me too. Like I don't remember what I wrote or who It also you wrote, doesn't or... help that I think, I think you and I both write these like really late at night and we're probably like a little delirious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this is like my fun writing yeah, on top is, of like everything else that I do. Th this is like, oh, I got to get to bed, but I really need <laughs> to write this scene tonight. Yeah, there'll be so many times I'm on my computer like right before bed and just kind of like typing notes to you or something Yeah, like planking that, out or, some stuff. Or just enhancing something here or there. So, um, yeah, yeah, so, so I, I think, yeah. So, yeah, so there was a lot of, but now that I think that we're rolling, I think it's good. Now yeah. that we have like a format, we have an idea of what we want it to be. You know, I think, we're, I think we even had those conversations. If we wanted to be like a Tales from the Crypt or like a Black Mirror. Yeah, yeah. Do we want it to have a theme? Like one of my friends was talking to me the other day and they're like, you know which Black Mirror episode's my favorite? And I was like, no, which one? And they, say, they said, the one where they say technology's bad. And I was like, that's my favorite too. Wow. Because they're all like, <laughs> and they're all about technology. They're all bad. about technology's bad. Yeah, um, I get it. I so we didn't, took like, me I a did, second. I didn't want to fall in that. Like, I mean, I, Black Mirror is a wonderful show. Like, I love it. Like, I watch every episode. It's very clever. Yeah. Um, but there is that tendency. Like, a, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Like, depending on the audience. Like, if you want to go in knowing what to expect, or you don't want to know what, what to expect when you go in. Like, that's why I prefer like the Twilight Zone. I mean, I love Black Mirror too, but I also like the Twilight Zone because like you turn it on like in a fourth of july marathon on sci-fi network and you don't know what episode you're going to get and maybe it's yeah. one you haven't seen before maybe like it's a morality tale maybe it's just like a 
uh, just a horror tale. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like a technology's bad episode. Or, you know, I guess people see most of them as morality tales, but not all of them. Some are just kind of fun or some kind some of... Some are just questions. They're, yeah, just they're, questions about what if, this yeah. or that, so... Yeah, some are just um, fun, clever ideas. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, that's my complaint about Black Mirror is it's too black, too morbid, dark, and it, it's not, like, fun. I mean, I, I, I like sort of the adventure that's really... I mean, like like Treasure Island is one of my favorite books. Like, mm-hmm. I like that kind of that that kind of adventure and that kind of you know excitement yeah. is. Um, I mean, I I do think Black Mirror is incredible writing. It's very clever. It's very sophisticated and uh, densely written stuff. And there's a lot going on, but it's just it's hard for me to like be like, yeah, it's so fun. I want to go out. I want to live life. And, yeah, I think we were talking about that too. Like we wanted to, the tonally, like what do we tonally want it to be? And I think yeah. Um, I think we still wanted to be fun, like a lot of it to, to try to be fun. Either the characters are wacky a little bit, or like there's something's off about the world or the story. Yeah, I mean, like having a, a bit of a tongue in cheek, mm-hmm. I guess, ness to the I, stories. I think for me, like the the biggest influence for Hidden Pages in terms of tone is like John dies at the end and Bubba Hotep, which is I think they're both directed by the same guy. And so, like, I I wanted to really maintain that, like, because that to me is like the most fun kind of story, like. I really appreciate heavy literature. I appreciate, um, you know, straight up comedy. But my favorite are kind of those, like those Goonies or Sandlots or John Dies at the End kind of things, where it's just like, or like Back to the Future, for an example. I mean, it's just like fun. It's so much fun. You feel like you're gonna explode. Like that's that's kind of the the stuff that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, uh, so let's let's talk about uh, Eternal Chorus specifically. Um, I don't know if like it's hard for us to to remember who wrote what, but I guess like what what pops out at you is something that was like a cool idea, a special thing that you remember us working on or writing that was something interesting. Um, uh, I think I remember like most of it coming from like you said that you did some time like as in a band, like traveling the country. I've never yeah. done that at all, so I, I remember that was kind of <clears> interesting. <throat> like you're pulling up from a bit of your past and putting it into. You These wrote characters. a lot of good stuff that was like pretty spot on with how a band would talk and act though. Like like I, I remember I wrote kind of like a watery version of like the beginning and then you came back and wrote a bunch of things and I was like, actually yeah, that's that's kinda how it was. So oh, it was cool. like it was like your it was like it was like your your projection of it was actually fairly accurate. I was a mobile DJ, like a wedding DJ oh, for yeah, like yeah. six years, so yeah. I guess there maybe some of that influence that because it's kind of the same thing you go like in a van to mm-hmm. the venue and set up and then you go back to the any road trip situation warehouse. is basically a band i mean you know as a, yeah. as a cheap band is just a long road trip is all it is <laughs> then you meet up with like your other djs and just like yeah. complain about the wedding that you were just at um we have to save that for like another show we have <laughs> maybe to talk about do. that yeah. for the next one a dj goes to a haunted i, I meant just on wedding. this show, on oh, the after okay. show. We, we, need, we need to hear about the real stories of a dj yeah they're interesting. Um, so I, I like that, and I liked, I think, I like the Vortex thing a lot. Um, just the idea of it. Just the idea of it. Actually, I think pretty soon after you brought that up of, like, them going stopping at this Vortexy thing, like, I was, I uh, went on a trip up north to the Redwoods, and um, oh. they have, like, a fun I'm, house thing. Somehow I think I did not know this, or, or, you, or you might have mentioned it and I glazed over it, but I don't think we talked at length And so we were this. driving by and I was like, I gotta stop! I gotta stop! And like, it's research! And then, eh, I kind like, of do remember <laughs> that now, actually. I, I do remember you talking about... Pulled the, over the car. I forget what it was called, too. I don't know. It was like, it was right uh, in there. That's because you were in the vortex. Yeah, that's the whole point. There. Maybe I'm still in there. You can't remember it. I can't. It's sort of like, you know, Dark City, getting the Shell Beach. No one knows how to get there. All I remember is... Walking in and walking out. I don't know what happened in between. Ah, oh, that's that's never a good thing. Uh, a lot of chipmunks. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, like after I was there, I was like, oh, that's good inspiration. Like yeah, let, let's keep on exploring that. Um, I, and I remember too, the vortex was very. You're right. We did spend a lot of time on that episode because we had like a whole ending, and then we were talking about like ah, we don't really like the ending, and then we basically had to like we we figured out a better ending together like we really hashed it out we just sat there at the coffee place we're like we're not leaving until we figure out like oh yeah i remember that i remember that and then and then like we had to kind of rewrite a lot of stuff in the middle but uh, yeah the vortex was a hard thing to like figure out like how like like what is the vortex like what happens when they get there because it's a it's always a letdown when people actually (laughs) show you what it is 
And so I think we had the advantage in that the vortex wasn't really anything until they got there. Like you didn't know if it was real or not, or if it was just mm-hmm. like, you know, some stupid gimmick, but um, yeah, writing the vortex and, and figuring out what that was, was a really difficult, like, and making it satisfying was a hard task. Yeah. Yeah. I think, this, yeah, I think we, I remember, I mean, I do remember sitting there and we're like, we're not going to leave until we figure that we have to figure this out. Like, yeah. like what, what is it? What, what's in the vortex? I think at one point yeah. like, Chelsea had tattoos that matched like the, the cape yeah. paintings and then like she activated uh-huh. the vortex and what else was there? Yeah. It was um, like, it was bleeding somehow. Like blood came out. Yeah, of, like, like, like we always kind of had the ancient connection like it connected to the past somehow mm-hmm. and then yeah and like chelsea got sucked into it because I, I think we we were debating like still i think we were still debating like what's the format of the show is it going to be like a new episode i mean a new set of characters each time is it going to be the same characters in a new situation each time mm-hmm. and so i think i think that was the direction we were going was like oh maybe it'll be the same characters but now they're going to end up in ancient egypt or something yeah you know? yeah like, <laughs> do they time travel or what and then i think we just came up with yeah. Yeah. We, we well, we came up with a a more an ending that satisfied that story and you know yeah. tied it off and it could just be it like that's yeah, that that's all it. that happened and then like left a little thread about like what happened to Aunt Monique. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe we'll come back to that and maybe Aunt Monique will show up somewhere in a different time in a different uh, who knows what's the vortex. I don't I know. know. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, even I think in, in post production I think because it changed a little bit from the script. I think I think I chopped out some. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I think I chopped out some lines that might have changed the direction, or, or or maybe I think I I recorded it differently. I told the actors to like ignore this line, or yeah, I added a Which line or two. I think it actually worked out better than what we had scripted because it kind of plays with the audio format, which is what I'm always interested in. Like, mm. how do we use this format to tell the story specifically? So when I have people listen to it, they always say. Like, oh, like when they get into the vortex and you start at the beginning of the story where he's like a bright blue van goes. Oh, right. Like they like they say I had to go back to see like what happened to the to the player. Uh, Like did something did I hit a button or did I? Yeah. Spoiler alert by this point. Yeah, I mean, this is after, right? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you've already watched it or listened listened to it, it. I should say. I guess you can watch it on YouTube if you want to see the sign that's been around. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Um, So people say that, which is like that gives me a thrill. Like, oh, wow, that's cool. Like. We kind of like War of the Worlds do you a little bit where you would think that you thought that yeah I'm I'm really proud of that ending I must say like uh, it's I, there's a lot of there are a lot of twist endings most of them are really bad I can safely say <laughs> I think our twist ending was one of the one of the more original twist endings in Hopefully. writing in modern writing I, I, when it comes to <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, like, I've never seen an ending quite so like, humble, like, like what we pulled. <laughs> hey, look, I'm just saying things like if. Humble, being humble is its own form of <laughs> ego, you know, of being of being an egomaniac. I mean, it's like it's basically a a soft way of saying that you're awesome, rather than just outright saying like, yeah, I'm really proud of like. I mean, if you built the pyramids, you'd be like, dude, I built the freaking pyramids. Like that was not easy. I know it doesn't yeah. look like much, but still, it was really hard. <laughs> Um, anyways, like I, I felt that that ending. Okay, so maybe it's not one of the greatest endings ever, but <laughs> no, it's it's definitely. Hey, I'm, I'm fine with it's it. It's definitely. I don't know if they are, but it's, I'm it's fine. It's definitely with that. an ending I never would have thought of myself capable of writing before <laughs> this opportunity. So I'm with you, buddy. It's the greatest ending of all time. Well, now, well, now the problem is I'm I'm learning with Eternal Chorus is like, well, how do we live up to the? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. To what we've already. Done. I think my brother listened to it and he was like, oh, you kind of blew your wad there with the <laughs> with the infinite loop, didn't you? I was like, uh, no, we got plenty of other we things. Got, coming. We got some great endings. <laughs> well, that's what I think we need to quickly establish. We're cooking up great ones, buddy. Well, that's what I'm kind of hoping we can quickly establish is like, yes, each episode has like a twist of a certain nature but they're not always going to be like blowing your mind like mind blowing kind of twist ending like they're all I mean I don't think most people are that blown away by the ending I think I'm just blown I'm just happy that that we wrote it and we came up with it I don't think anybody else really cares (laughs) so but I like it and um, we're not going to shamble on you every time people right but but I I do think there's a certain uh, it's a good challenge. It's a good mental challenge to try to think of a twist ending each time. And I think so far with the the, f- the four episodes we have in the queue, I think we've done a pretty good job, like keeping it fresh in terms of the twist. Yeah. I think that's what we kind of. I mean, I, no, that's what I wanted to work on doing this. You know, as a practice. 
Yeah. Just practice my writing, essentially. You know? Oh, yeah, you said that because you said there was a couple movies you had watched. You had watched, like, I think maybe Cloverfield Lane was one of them, and you were saying, like, it, it made you realize you really wanted to practice, like, the not just the like the twist ending, but the twist any moment in the movie, like going from any point to another point unexpectedly. Yeah, like a, just in the scenes or something, or just keep on just practice how to switch things up or how to yeah. take it in a direction that you don't expect. Right. Um, For me, what's hard is doing a twist that's both unexpected yet like uh, logical and uh, and satisfying. I mean, something that's a twist and you didn't expect it, but it's also like that's exactly the way it should have gone. Like mm-hmm. now that you have retrospect, you know, or, or like now that you have the path, like now that you can look back on it, it's like, how did I not see it coming? Because for me, Cloverfield Lane was slightly disappointing in that, yeah, it had some twists. It, it went some places I didn't see where it was going. But it was kind of like, yeah, you, you could have tw- you know, thrown that any direction and it would have been interesting. I mean, like, depending on how you spun it. So I didn't feel like the choices they made were like that amazing. It was like they made the choices at the right time. I think timing is really important with when you switch things as much as the content of what you switch it with. What do you think? Um, I think I just got to get better at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that can do it better than me, I'm like, I got to do it better than how I do it. So I, I um, that's what I really wanted to work on. And I think it's getting better because I'm working on a new feature now that's a thriller. And as I'm doing the outline even, I'm thinking... What's, is this one that I'm familiar with? Or is this I don't new? think so, no. I'm starting a new, a new one. What's the, can, you, can you give us like a, a hint? Oh, I don't know. know. Is, yeah. it, is it like under your, your manager won't won't let you? Know? <laughs> this is studio. This is still under studio. Lock. Makes you write it like on on location. <laughs> this is still under lock and key, but it's a thriller. I can tell you that much. It's a thriller. It's a thriller. Um, I'm thrilled already. But that that genre demands that you make unexpected choices and kind of twist yeah. and turn things. So just even doing my outline now, we're just kind of thinking about things like I want to. I'm I'm constantly surprising myself because I'm like, oh like. Yeah, like that's how it should. Like this is how this character should manipulate that character, or this is how they yeah. would do it, or this is how they should do it, or like this character is going to call that character's bluff unexpectedly, or something. Just something as simple as yeah. that in the scene. Now, like when you're writing, do you have to make a conscious effort to improve? Like, like do you say to yourself, "I'm going to sit down today and I'm I'm just thinking about how to make these characters better, or how to make this uh, scene flow better," or do you? Like and like and, and when I say like, do you think about it consciously? Like, are you in the moment thinking about it, or do you kind of like say to yourself some point in the month, this month I'm gonna try to be a better uh, plot twister, and then you just hope that your subconscious bleeds into it? Like, how do you work with that? Um, I think I just try to tackle projects that I that I know like I'm mm, that's smart need to yeah. need to enhance on. So like same thing, like I really want to enhance on these twists because even that that's just beneficial in anything like comedy drama like yeah. the better you can you know flip something on its head unexpectedly that's what's what entertains the audience so mm-hmm. that's why like I don't know if anybody will ever read this thriller that I'm writing or what but like I just knew that I wanted to practice by writing a thriller trying it you know going mm. to watch a lot of those thriller movies so is it, is it like a like a thriller like memento is it like salt or like is it no. you know, like what kind of thriller it'd be like more of a... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that by the way oh I it's guess. great Oh, is it? Um, look, look pretty. That's like or, an action thriller. Yeah. This is more of a psychological thriller, I guess. Oh, okay. So, so maybe, like Gone Girl or something, or yeah, like something like a Gone Girl. Okay. Probably. Yeah, that's probably pretty close to. Like one, yeah, like those. All right, Aaron, I'm specking those, God, those Gone Girl two paperback thrillers. <laughs> I'm writing Gone Girl two on spec. You busted me. I'm sure they're not. They're hammering down her door to do that. But I, <laughs> I doubt she will. Um. So yeah, uh, that's that's what so that's what I'm working on. Mm. Feature wise, like you I sort just of did f- that with the second episode. It's, it's. I guess it's more of action thriller. The second ep- episode of Hidden Pages, but you, you kind of got your thriller ish. Yeah, yeah. So kind of, yeah, a little bit. It's a little sci-fi. Kind of like a techno thriller. I call it. It's not. It's it's sci-fi, but barely just sci-fi to be called sci-fi. It's, yeah. it's like a Michael Crichton kind of techno thriller. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Um, That's the one we just recorded, by the way. Yeah, the episode two. I'm, I was gonna have something ready to like cut away to for this episode but it's it's not ready it's not it's not ready for prime time yet um so what was i saying anyways you're, you're like, talking yeah. about your thriller and how you're working on it specifically and like do you what, what kind of effort you make to improve as a writer yeah so you know I, I, that's what i'm just working on right now just to try to get i mean I, I work on a lot of things at the same time which is something my um yeah you write a lot man you write like a ton 
This is like the only thing I write. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I mean, I write other things that are prose that are mm. that are not for screenwriting, but sure. yeah. Yeah, so I think um Yeah, I mean I'm working on a lot of different things at the same time, so I just like I said, I wanted to work on this thriller just to, to see what I could do. Mm-hmm. You know, so maybe I mean I have other aspects of uh, writing that I need to get better at as well, or just kind of improve. Um, which I think doing this actually as a, you know, I, it's more than just an exercise. I mean, it's something that I'm passionate about, something that I really like uh, doing. But at the same time, like it, it allows me to kind of work out some things. I can mm-hmm. go back and listen to it. There's a reason I listen to it eight nine times because I mean, not yeah. only do I love it, but like also like I can hear like, oh, okay, well maybe maybe next time when I'm writing, I can think about dialogue this way or think oh, about it that way point. or think about you know, character introductions this way or how to, cause you still have to describe people. That's something that's kind of, um, parallel in screenwriting and this is like, you still mm. have to give people an idea in their head. It's theater of the mind. Yeah. Essentially. So you kind of have to give them a picture of how to, um, how to, how to think. Um, you bring up two interesting points there. One is that this is a great way doing something like this. Even if you're not, you, you if you're a screenwriter and your goal is, just to be a screenwriter, you're not trying to like make a show like what we're doing. It seems like a really good practice to like get something that you've done recorded because like you said, you can listen. It's so much more fun to listen to what you've written than it is to mm-hmm. read it again. And I feel like you really pick up on the thing, the beats a little bit better and the ideas and you can kind of like, I mean, my, my best ideas come like, for example, when I'm driving for some reason like that's or or when I'm like in commute when I'm riding my bike when I'm walking mm-hmm. uh, I feel like my brain is the most free but I can't really like re reread my stuff when I'm when I'm uh, you know driving like I have to like listen to it and like I, I would listen to our show as I was driving and that's when I would get kind of like ideas for the next episode and mm-hmm. something like that so I think you're right that like recording your stuff as a writer is a great way to figure out uh, how to improve and then um uh, I don't remember what the second point was now, so I'm sorry. It'll 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 come back to me eventually. Um, so it'll be lost to <laughs> it'll lost be, to the universe. It'll be hidden in some pages in your mind. Well, that's the problem when I try to enumerate my ideas and I <laughs> embellish the first one too much. Forget how to count. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I forgot. I guess. Well, that's, we have, our beers are empty now, so that's the <laughs> I problem. guess so. Um, what was I saying? Eh, whatever. Well, I think I think uh, I'll start rambling here. It'll come back to me. Um, so yeah, the first idea is that it's great to get the episodes. So 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 you're basically talking about how this is not just a this is not just something that you love. It's also an exercise. And I was saying that listening to what you've written is a great way to get better at what you're doing. And yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that, I guess, because like, that's a, that's a really important thing that I think, um, a lot of people need to do is like, it helps you to break outside of what, of your normal routine Mm -hmm. when you're working on this stuff. Yeah. I think I was telling a friend, uh, a a screenwriting peer of mine that it's like working on this is very like freeing for me because a lot of times, like when you're working in the screenplay format or the TV format and when you're writing pilots and specs and, uh, features as well like you, you got to follow the rules like yeah it's all the rules structure not always but you know there's there's things yeah. you have to do like um you know gotta hit this beat this bat this, this right. beat this beat you know gotta character has to be like this yeah um especially like when you're specking a tv show or something like that like you have to follow the flow of the tv show and while it's like it's fun to be creative and like what would i do with this episode of yeah uh, you know, brooklyn 99 or superstore mm-hmm. or rick and morty or whatever but you have written for all those by the way right uh, Spectrum. I haven't. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's what I mean. You've, yeah. you've written for them, but not. You, you, yeah. And you get paid to do it, but you no. did it anyway. I've written specs of those. Um, well, it's fun. Like at the same time, like it's it's I. What I found in doing this is like a free. It's just kind of being in third grade again, and just having like creative writing. There's no. Just, yeah. Where like, I think I fell in love with writing in the first place. I was at a summer school and. I took a creative writing class. I don't know. My mom signed me up for it or something. Nah. <laughs> I don't even that know how it was the genesis there. of it, huh? I guess so. And the wow. teacher was just like, if you write a story that's three pages, come back 
and I will give you like a bag of popcorn or something. Oh, <laughs> like food. That. That, that, there it is. Like <laughs> I think food, that's, food as the as, as the, the motivator. Reward. Yeah. So I think that's where it all started, and I was just like, that is so fun. We like, have to write just, that into one of the shows now. That's, yeah, that's maybe, a great little. If you hear that, you'll you'll, you'll get know used why to where it came from. But I, I think, actually remember my second point now because you you brought it up when you were talking about uh, the problem with formats is. Um, that's what's tricky. That's the trickiest thing for me about, besides the actual content of hidden pages. What's hard too is about the format. Is we are really probably unnecessarily straddling that line between something that reads like a screenplay mm -hmm. and something that reads for audio, because everything we're doing is written uh, in present tense. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, so he is going to the store. He gets in his car. Like nothing's written in past tense. Like most most narratives are written in past tense, and we don't overly describe things because in screenwriting that's considered like a bad thing. You don't mm -hmm. want to over be overly descriptive or prosaic in that regard. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think one of the hardest things for me is and 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 one of the feedback that I received on hidden pages is like you don't want the narrator in there too much. You definitely want, even though people love the narrator, they, they like the dialogue and the back and forth more. Mm. So for me, the, like the hardest thing with the format of the show is like living between still trying to satisfy our screenwriting, like resume and our portfolio of screenwriting kind of credentials. Cause in, in the end we want to be able to prove to people that we can write stuff for the screen, even though this is stuff for, for, for the years, uh, trying to make things cinematic yet still entertaining as, a, as an audio form that to me is is not easy yeah no I like I like that this is also getting feedback I like hearing the feedback for this as well because it's like it is different than like I don't like I welcome all feedback on this because mm -hmm. like it's we're kind of creating something that's different and new and stuff so uh, I, I do enjoy like this is you know pulling Pulling the curtain, what do they say? Behind, looking behind the curtain. Oh, yeah. I guess like it's lifting up the hood. I don't know. <laughs> pulling back the curtain, I think, is a theater term. Oh yeah, the theater. So the you see the background, but yeah, like you know, like you said, like some people said, like the narrator. Some people say, like, well, I liked uh, one of my one of my friends said, well, I really liked that you made the unexpected choice when they got to their van and it started. It wasn't just like a... Uh, the He's trope, like, for the once, trope. the van starts. Yeah, like, as it should. I mean, like most things do. It's a trust. It's a creeper's van, but it's a, a trusty, trusty van. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, just, like, even that, like a detail that small, like just trying to think out the box like that as well. Like, I like that someone appreciated that. Like, we're not going to, you know. Yeah, because that's... A, that's what that's, you always because, expect. Because, and we always know the answer to that little thing. I mean, it's always... It's yeah. always going to start in the in the nick of time, and that's not mm -hmm. that's like a cheap a cheap uh, a cheap win, and it's and, and it's not even a win. It's just a cheap way to extend the suspense. Yeah, and I I just think like you should have extended the suspense elsewhere rather than that yeah. scene. Yeah. So, so yeah, I like I like I like getting the feedback for this because it's it's different than the typical like yeah. you get notes on a screenplay or a pilot mm -hmm. or a spec. So to a certain extent, you kind of know. What to expect, but with, with, with something like this, like some, you you might hear feedback that's like, "Whoa, where did, where did you get that? Like, I like that, or I'm gonna yeah. think about that," because they're they're trying to imagine things in their mind and they're listening to it, and you don't know how they're listening to it, or, or um, uh, what I really enjoy about the audio format too, that's different than the screen play in movies, is that, uh, like I'm a I'm a Latino man, a man of. In case uh, you can't tell, on, <laughs> you can't on tell. This audio. Yeah, like you can't tell, like, uh, of 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 Mexican heritage. I'm a Mexican American. I'm not, um, by the way, yeah, just in case anybody else is wondering. Um, but I like that, you know, in the theater of the mind, it's like, it's whoever you imagine it to be. It's not, there's yeah. no, there's no like yeah. skin color mm -hmm. or anything. Like it can, if you want it to be a cast of, you can really fill in the blank people that look yeah. like your friends. Like then it is. Like, yeah. It, it, it you're just listening to these voices, and you can kind of. It's closer, and in, in, in that sense, it's closer to literature, which to me is still kind of the ultimate storytelling medium. Um, for that, for that particular reason, is you can fill in the details, the details that are most important to you can kind of yeah. get filled in that way. I well, agree. As I know, like representation on the screen is a big deal right now because like we want to see people on the screen that like you know it's like yeah. the, movies like Wonder Woman are important. Like we want to see like a female action hero. And it, and to me, it's just. I get the concern about, you know, there there is a lot of political correctness going on in Hollywood and, you know, people can have that debate. But for me, it's like 
regardless of what the outcome of that debate is, it's a it's a distraction for me from just getting to the the best part, which is like a really good story. Because when I was growing up, I didn't think about the politically correct kind of like oh. How does this represent, you know, the demographic of, of these people or this situation or this political? I just wanted like a good story. I didn't even think about the the background of the characters. Like mm-hmm. it was, it, and like maybe when you're a kid, you don't, you do, but you don't realize it because you're not old enough to, to understand your own subconscious yet. But I, I just, I, I like like the hidden pages kind of stuff too, because I, I just want to get back to really pure storytelling where it's, we're not thinking about all these other things that. That, that Hollywood's trying to think about right now. It's like, I just want some good stories with interesting concepts, some twists, some laughs, and like that really get you thinking and beyond all the stuff that's kind of so petty today, for me at least, that's kind of how it seems. Mm-hmm. But maybe I'm... Well, I think that maybe that's why like the stories end up the way they do, because like, I mean, I, I, I definitely try to have like a socially conscious like perspective of things and like representation. Yeah, they just comes from a different background. I but. think I think that's how we balance each other. I'm <laughs> yeah, like, I'm so like I think the opposite. So I think that that it works. Like you know. Yeah, that's a tip too. I'd give somebody is find somebody who's definitely whom you who whom you work with well, but is also like very at the same time very because I think you and I left our own devices write very different mm-hmm. stuff, which is kind of interesting, considering how well we work together. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. So, Speaking yeah. of that, we we should talk about how we met. Oh. <laughs> It's so Hollywood. We were both at the post office at the Grove, and we were both both mailing out our screeners to film festivals. Yeah, that's so random. Like, Isn't that weird? <laughs> it's like the weirdest and, and thing. The, and, like, usually you connect with somebody like that. I, I remember I was, like, you know, like we were both grabbing the like out the envelopes and filling yeah. them out. You know, I had my discs. You had yours. Like, oh, <laughs> you're, you're doing a screener? I was like, yeah, you're doing a screener? And, <laughs> okay. and sure enough, you know. Why well, aren't we just a couple of loser aren't, aren't, screeners? Aren't we just a couple mailer of, outers. of chumps? Yeah. <laughs> And we might so, as well have just been like in the parking lot, like burning forty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Are you burning forty dollars? Oh, yeah, I am burning forty dollars uh, too. That would be a great like <laughs> like little video to we're make. We're gonna change the story. Yeah. That's what we were doing. Yeah, we had our DVDs in front of us, and we were just burning forty dollars. We're in, basically in the yeah, just lot. like our, and putting our dreams on a piece of paper <laughs> with some money and burning it. Yeah, I don't uh, think I got into that festival. Did you? The one that I was submitting to. You know, I don't even remember which one I submitted to. No. That's the set. I, I hope I'm just gonna say it was one that I that a one that I got into. Just just to make oh, myself okay. feel better. <laughs> the, the one, the only one that um, I got into, the Julian Dubuque Film Festival uh-oh. in Iowa. <laughs> it, was, it was a good film festival though. I mean I was really impressed. And I've been to a few of those like new kind of up and coming starter film fests. It was pretty mm-hmm. good. But yeah, I think I think just that whole just the whole setup from the get go. Oh, and then of course you had your screenwriting meetup group, which is really the impetus for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to yeah. continue to talk to each other. Because I think I was pretty new to LA when I first met. I must have been like maybe like two months in, maybe. Yeah, you just... were still kind of like. Uh, I didn't know anybody really. I didn't yeah, you people, were looking but... for work and kinda yeah, hit, yeah, just kind of hit out. the ground. So like, uh, yeah, I think I met. I was just like, just you, totally you, you, you're mailing it. You're doing the same yeah. thing I am. Let's be friends. I think, yeah, I let's... guess. <laughs> I'm lonely. <laughs> We're both mailing out screeners. That, that's enough. I mean, I was kind of new. I mean, I moved here in 2011, and then that was 2013, I think. I started, I mailed out those screeners. So, yeah, like, I was relatively, you know, I was there two years, mm-hmm. less than that. Um, so. Yeah, then we started the group, and so we have the group, the, the screening yeah. group, and I kind of get, got to know each other better and kind of what we work on and stuff. And I think we had similar interests about, like, you know, kind of things are out there. You know, I, I really like to study and watch videos on YouTube about like aliens and Bigfoot. And I like to think it's because we're we're both very different, but we're both also we're both also mid Midwesterners, which I think gives us like an un. I thought you were Arizona. I well, mean, I, I grew up there, but I'm also but my family was I was born in Indiana. You know, oh, visited yeah. there a lot. Okay. And my parents have that Midwestern. Sure. You know, vibe. And so, yeah, and I, I was raised in Arizona. So I, I have a mixed background, but it's like, you know, I still think of myself as kind of a mid. I, I got some Midwestern. <laughs> Midwestern. Uh, mid, Midwestern personality. Okay. Yeah, I'm from Minnesota as well, St. Paul. Um, but I think what's funny also is that you grew up in Arizona around a bunch of Latino, Mexican yeah, people. Yeah, most of my friends. And I grew up in Minnesota around a bunch of white, white people. people. <laughs> so maybe that's the yin and yang of how we work that's together. That's the beauty of America. America. <laughs> so, so you're yeah. more. Mexican in some ways than I am, and I'm more white than you are in some ways, I guess. I su- like, well, what do you like, mayonnaise? 
Mayonnaise? Yeah, do you like mayonnaise? Uh, um, I hate it. Miracle Whip, yeah. Oh, I hate mayonnaise. Well, I guess we're both not that white then. Although I, I have, I got some uh, Chipotle mayonnaise sitting in the fridge that I enjoy. That I do like, though. That's so pretty I don't, good. I don't know what that, like, what does that make you? If, if you like mayonnaise, but it's Chipotle mayonnaise, are you, are you definitely like <laughs> That makes mixed? me me, buddy. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> that makes me a Mexican-American and growing up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, that's um, that's a that's always fun to chat about. Hey, yeah. let's uh let's wrap up with the second episode then. Um, so what 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 are you looking forward? So you haven't I've I've just recorded it like two weeks ago. I finally recorded it all. Like, what are you looking forward to hearing? Oh man! Like, what are you ex- like excited about? Because because Sammy's heard nothing. I've heard I've nothing about it. Like, I miss all the he, yeah, production he's... record. I've ne- never met the actors. I wanted to thank them. I'm very 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 blessed to have such, like I said like a very great cast to work with the people that you know that. I'll try to do like uh-huh. yeah, I'll, I'll, like one of these days we'll, well. Do, we'll do one of these shows on a night where we can all get together. And... Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, so yeah. But I'm looking forward to um, this one is a little more serious than Eternal Chorus, I think. Um, it turned out a little more serious in tone, so I'm wondering. I'm looking forward to hearing how a slightly darker version of Eternal Chorus yeah. sounds. Yeah, well, well, Gene definitely helped to, like, Gene's almost the comedic relief. Great, Gene, great. Gene's, <laughs> Gene's, Gene is Sammy's friend who was a newcomer to the to the troupe, the Hidden Pages acting troupe, and he he, he freaking nailed it. It was awesome. Yeah, Gene Augusto, he's an uh, uh, improv guy around town. Yeah, might, as well, sh- and, might uh, as well do a shout-out to all the actors real quick. Yeah, so we yeah. Got, okay, so narrator, so start with Hidden Pages, narrator, Eric Pierce, uh, uh, Joey was played by Scott Baxter. He's you know all, all these people are actors in Los Angeles, so you can look them up. Mm-hmm. And then Chelsea was played by my good friend and colleague. Uh, Ch- it was Kate Huffman, but Chelsea also played the uh, the polarizing character of Comus, <laughs> the the young boy. Some people show. really hate Comus, and some people really love Comus. That's that that I think is a good sign. Yeah. So. Um, Comus was our, our big hit. We'll have to make a t-shirt with him. And then uh, we got Jeff Harlow played Keith in that one. Andy Gates played Albert, the the uh, Vortex, uh, the, the tour guide of the of it. Mm-hmm. And then my wife, Mary Taylor, played Yuja and the tween girl at the end. I think those are all the actors in that one. And then... In, and the second one, which is the God Box, is the name of this next yeah, title. Box. We got pretty much the same cast, minus Jeff Harlow, minus Scott Baxter, and we have uh, the addition of Gene Ag- Augusto, right? Augusto, yeah. Augusto, and uh, yeah, we'll do a shout out to them once we. Uh, yeah. Once and Gene's we, a once terrific. We it. I, I met him at uh, I did the NHMC Writing Fellowship, TV Writing Fellowship, mm-hmm. back in October. So Explain to people like what that is. Like. So it's a National Hispanic Media Coalition. They have a fellowship every year for TV writers, and it's uh, a simulated writers' room. So they pick ten writers to be mm. in the fellowship, and you have five weeks to to create a uh, pilot. And you meet with uh, it's sponsored by ABC and NBC, and so you meet with executives at mm. ABC and NBC and get to you know to get to know them, and they get to know you, like who you are, what what your writing's all about, yeah, what influences it and stuff. So it's really good about just opening doors into the industry and trying to get. You know, working, um, start working and start getting a network to work in to try to. Um, and that, and that to was a working. fellowship. Is that it's what a that's? fellowship? Yeah. Uh-huh. So it's a five week fellowship. So if anybody writers listening, yeah, like, definitely like, if, doesn't know what that is. Like, we'll start looking into the whole fellowship. Yeah, I think uh, so. we're in uh, July 2017. I think the deadline is August. I think next month for this year's uh, class. So uh, it's a National Hispanic Media Coalition. If you're a, um, uh, a TV writer of Latino heritage. That could be any. I'm from Arizona, South so Arizona. does that count? I uh, maybe I don't. I mean, I'm not even technically all the way. F- I mean, I just was raised. There, so. <laughs> you could try. <laughs> I don't think you have to be Latino, but the, you know, it, it's definitely to help. Um, Themed like a cultural if awareness. Yeah, if yeah. you're trying to get Latino voices into the media landscape, then they'll definitely look at your work. So, yeah, I don't. I don't think you have to be Latino, but mostly end up. It ends up that usually way. Usually, the people that are interested in having a Latino yeah, voice out there makes, most of the makes time. Makes sense. Most of the time, Latino. So. Makes sense. Um, well, that's the beauty of this show is we're trying to really dive into cultures beyond time and space here. With, yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. So, so. Um, so yeah, so so I met Gene there, and the and we have table reads, and everybody would love for Gene to read uh, yeah, the character because Gene does like a lot of voices, like a master of imitation, and uh, so he he always did voices. So like when this came up, I was like I. 
like we got to get Gene in here. Yeah, so, now he's um, he, he he fit right in with everybody else. Awesome, awesome. We recorded, by the way, at the MVP Music, which is on Hauser and Pico. It's a great music store. It's fairly new, and it's a awesome place if you want to buy some guitar strings, want some drums, yeah, give them a plug, man. If you want a theremin, they got those there. Uh, it's a cool place. So yeah, MV- MVP Music let us uh, record there. It was really nice of them. Do they sell Monster Rockstar energy drinks? Uh, for when you're raging on the drums, or you something? could you could get that at the bodega across oh, okay. the street. Yeah, uh, <laughs> along, with, along with many other things. A lot of energy to do that. Drumming. I used to be a drummer in junior high. No way! I never knew this. I yeah, I, I, like I play I, drums. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh. Have, they're, they're, they got a, they got two drum sets in the maybe in the I'll go to room that maybe I I'll go to a recording session. We'll jam one time. You know, one of these days, you got if you ever get a day off from work, you should do the. Uh, and we do a hidden pages when you should come to it and like see the whole setup. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, we all cram in this tiny little whisper room and we and we do the episodes. Excellent. Um, so. So yeah, but yeah, I guess that's what I'm looking forward to the most is just uh, just hearing how a bit how of a we, more serious tone turns out. Because like I said, we're learning as we're going as well. Yeah. So, which, which is kind of the fun of it. Um, and then I have another project, uh, which this might kick off that because I it's a uh, geekyphebes.com and it's a transmedia mm. story about. A young woman going from a bashful bookworm to a social butterfly, and one of the elements is like an audio play now. So I've written like a script for like an audio play, like an hour and a half audio play. So depending on how the season turns out, yeah, you know, and you know, maybe go rewrite that and maybe produce that at some point as well. Just kind of getting another. We've been talking about doing premium content for people who really like the show and want to, you know, actually buy stuff. Like stuff like that might be cool as a bonus. Oh, bonus sure. gift to have along if you yeah. buy it. Anyway, something But I'm like having that. a lot of fun doing this, and I'm learning a lot about not only storytelling, but also like the radio format and podcasting in, in general. So Yeah, I mean, for been, me, the biggest benefit is just, like I said earlier, is working with you as a partner. And I just, I advise anybody who's working solo, try doing the partner thing, because I, I learned so much faster. I mean, it's like it's like uh, being a, it's like being a, a, a guitarist and having like a fellow guitar player help you write riffs. I mean, it's just something... Mm-hmm like special about working together with with somebody and if you're writing like a book i can see doing it solo is you know kind of the way to go but if but like screen screenwriting there's something inherently i don't know what it is there's something inherently like symbiotic yeah there's something that really it really jives well when you have like a couple like like not too many people but like two people seems to be the a good a good team for screenwriting yeah i think that's all they allow in the guild anyway oh do they oh <laughs> teams of two teams of two no well, more than five, I think. Um, when the guild comes knocking on my door, yeah. then I'll, I'll know the answer to that. <laughs> but cool, so, man. Well, thanks so much for stopping by and doing yeah, the show. Um, and I'm glad whoever is listening is listening. Hopefully, as they well. have a bit of insight into the show and us and stuff. So yeah, and there's plenty more to come. We're not slowing down. Uh, oh crap! Is it thehiddenpages.net or it's the hidden pages? The hidden pages. Dot net. I, and I should know. I bought the domain. And I can't even remember. <laughs> Yeah, the hidden pages that's where everything's going to be it's also on youtube um just type in you know hidden pages and the name of the episode and it's on itunes now thanks to your awesome brother oh yeah yeah we should shout out his name uh and his company ryan garza of <laughs> uh podlettermedia.com i think it's dot com i'm sure he'll he'll yeah. correct us <laughs> but yeah he he was super helpful in getting there all the technical stuff going so yeah definitely. yeah a lot of help. Very, very lucky to have a lot of people helping us along the way as well. Yeah, it's so. kind of amazing how many people have worked on the show. Because when I was doing the credits for the first one, I mean, like, we had a lot of help. Mm-hmm. So. Definitely. So. Well, good night, and Sammy, and... Uh, or good thank, morning, or good afternoon. It's almost going to be morning. <laughs> yeah, like like whenever you're listening to it. But I, I, yeah. I always like to think of every, every podcast takes place at night. You know, it's oh, like yes. it's like 3 a.m., yeah. you know, and that's when... I'm a fan when, of... Uh, that's when podcast magic is made. I really love the uh, radio format, so I always listened to Coast to Coast AM growing up. In the uh, <laughs> I think George Norrie, I think Art Bell, too, said good morning, good evening. And good night. He's good like night. he's like Truman. Good morning, good evening, around the world. In case I don't yeah. see you later, <laughs> which I probably whatever won't. you're listening to it around the world. Yeah, I, that, that's why for me everything's just like at two or three a.m. Yeah. So. Well, signing off, and we'll see you in the God Box. Mm-hmm.